a proven fact that if you find things to be grateful for, express gratitude for, and thanks for every day, it will revolutionize your life. We're in a season of thanksgiving, but you know what? We Christians ought to make the whole year a season of thanksgiving. I've got a friend who likes to celebrate Christmas all year round. He thinks about decorating his tree when Christmas is over for the next year. And we have fun with him, and he just loves Christmas. But listen, listen, we love our Lord, and we're grateful to him this morning. So let's stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus, and then we're going to sing together. and y'all can wait till after the service to visit. Y'all just supposed to greet each other and love on each other. We got some singing to do. Oh, God bless you. Praise God for such a friendly church and for people who love other people. We're going to count our blessings this morning with hymn number 585. Count your blessings. The words are on the screen.
count those blessings. Be seated. We know who we can give the glory to for those blessings, and we're going to sing a song of tribute. My tribute. <coughs> Goodness, y'all. That was good. <laughs> and to God be the glory for it. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Number 576. It's going to be on the screen. Stand with me. This is our offertory song together.
Let's go with the Lord in prayer before we proceed to the proclamation of his word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the songs that have already been sung, how our hearts have been encouraged. The different songs have different messages. And each, each song and its message, Father, I believe has found a place in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we're just thankful that we can sing and we can praise you because I know, Father, that singing is a very important part of worship. And Father, I just want to thank you for the way that you've gifted Candy Fork with the, the gifts of being able to sing and to praise you. And now, Father, I pray that you'll take the songs that we've sung and may it be that which prepares our hearts to be receptive to your word. And Father, I just pray now that as I try to preach your word that you'll just hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Pray that Jesus Christ will be honored, he'll be uplifted, and he'll be glorified. And that, Father, your people will be edified. And, Father, I just pray that you'll take these few moments that we have during this time as I surrender this message unto you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. This morning, I'm going to be preaching a message entitled Celebrating Thanksgiving. I think that's very appropriate, don't y'all? Okay? Celebrating uh, Thanksgiving is so, so important. But, you know, when we think about celebrating Thanksgiving, there's a few things I believe is vitally important that we must understand. And when I say the word celebrating Thanksgiving, we must understand the spirit of gratitude is not outdated. Did you hear what I just said? The spirit of gratitude is not outdated. 
And I like what Brother Don said earlier when he came up and just began the service. Uh, do you know what's one of the best things for us to do in our lives is to get up in the morning and to be able to be grateful for what God has blessed us with and, and just begin to thank God for certain things. Do you know that's one of the reasons I don't, I don't watch the news anymore much? Now, y'all going to think I'm crazy. I used to be one of those people. That, but when I got up in the mornings, I want to know what was going on in the world. I'd watch this news or I'd catch this, and I just wanted to know. If you want to be discouraged today, get up in the morning and watch news. <laughs> It'll ruin your day, okay? So the best thing that I do is I just don't even watch the stuff, and I'll just listen to a few things along the way. But here's the thing you got to realize. Bad news in, bad news out. Good news in, good news out. And so I really believe this. It is so important that we just realize that we can count our many blessings, have a spirit of gratitude, and that spirit will affect your attitude throughout the whole day. So be mindful of that. Just be mindful of God. I just want to have a grateful spirit within me. And when that begins to take place in our life, it'll, it'll affect our attitude. It'll affect our whole outlook upon the day's life in which we have to live. And so be thinking about that. The spirit of gratitude, it's not outdated. It needs to be updated today. Amen? It really needs to be. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Psalms, okay? And we're going to be looking at Psalm 100. Now hold your breath when I say this. We're going to read the whole Psalm. Don't have but five verses. You like that now, don't you? Okay. Don't have but five verses, but let's look at Psalms 100 and listen what the writer had to say. He says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. For thankful or be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Wow. When you read that particular psalm in general, remember this. The greatness of God is characterized in this psalm. And when you look at the bedrock of this whole psalm, there is praise and there is thanksgiving. But underneath all of that is the greatness of God, the magnitude of who God is. And when we begin to understand the characteristic of who God is, and he's characterized in this psalm, it will help you and me to have the type spirit of thanksgiving that needs to come from our lives that we can have a positive effect upon other people. So when you and I read this psalm, be mindful of that. It is talking about the greatness of God and his character, which will affect our outlook upon life. Also remember this. Remember what you find in verse 4 here. Verse 4 is, is what I'm going to build the whole message around, I believe, in application. So watch what it says in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Now, this is enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let me share something with you. And I've always said this. How in the world can you come to expect God to show up in your life on Sunday if he hasn't prepared your heart for Sunday? A lot of times we've got to realize coming to worship and to praise him has a lot to do with the aspect of full week before we ever arrive at church. I remember, I don't want to say his name, I can tell you his name. I remember way back when I was a, a youth minister years and years ago. That was a long time ago. I was just like about a sophomore in college. It was back in the early 80s. And I can remember uh, serving on staff there as a youth minister. Uh, there was this guy that was a school teacher, and he was kind of a jokester, you know. 
but he was just a, just a real good Christian man, served during the life of a church in West Tennessee. And I'll never forget one day, uh, the pastor and I was standing there and people were coming in and coming in. And, you know, you're shaking people's hands and you're saying, hey, man, how's your week been? Oh, I've had a good week, this and this and this. Sammy seen us, well, I'll tell you his first name, I'm going to tell you his last name. Anyway, Sam, Sammy seen us. He seen us standing there and he thought, I'm going to get the preacher and the youth director, the youth minister today. He walks up and Brother Paul says, how's your week been? And he just stops. He looks at both and he says, boy, it's been terrible. He said, man, it's been one terrible week. And I said, you know, really? And the pastor says, really? Then he just says, I got you. <laughs> I got y'all, you know. Then he went to laughing because he knew that we had, we had bit it. Okay, we, we got on to it. And so he went to He hadn't had a bad week at all. He just wanted to have a little fun. He was picking with us. But let me say this. This is vitally important for us to understand. If we have a thankful heart, a spirit of gratitude, I want you to know it is very important that when we do that, we can worship God because it says enter his gates with thanksgiving. When we come to God's house, we need to be have, having a thankful heart when we get here. Enter to his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and then bless his name. What an ideal setting and what an ideal attitude to have when we come to God's house. So, so important. Now, when we think about that, let's think about this. We need a thankful spirit in our lives. Would you agree with me on that? We definitely do. So thinking about that, let's move from that and let's talk about what we're going to be celebrating this week. A thankful heart, a thankful spirit, a thankful attitude should be characterized in our lives so much. Remember this, Thanksgiving in itself apparently grew out of what we know as the Harvest Home Festivals that were celebrated in England. That's the reason when the colonies were uh, put together, when they all came together in the, in the eastern part of the United States. What we've got to realize is this. Homecoming to them was a time of festivity. Their homecoming was kind of like that of a spirit of thanksgiving. So they would get together and celebrate with one another, and they would have these home harvest festivals, and they celebrated that in England. Well, guess what? That happened to carry over to the new land here as well, okay? So when they came here in the, the early years in the 1600s, we've got to realize it was a time that they would celebrate for the crops, the good crop years, and they would also celebrate the bountiful blessings that God had blessed them with. So they could thank God for the crops, for the blessings, and th they could thank God for so many things because this was a new discovery for them. So when they began to do that, they realized that they needed to continue to celebrate with the spirit of thanksgiving that they had brought from England. And so what we realize is this, the early colonists themselves had their first thanksgiving in 1619. So in 1619, they had their first Thanksgiving. But the thing about the first Thanksgiving was this. It was totally religious. And so what happened was, it was a time of worship, a time of praise. It was like a magnitude of, of a worship service where they just gave God praise, and it was strictly religious. But you know what happened? This is a joke now, y'all, okay? They brought in a few Baptists with their fried chicken, okay? Okay? They brought in some folks. Now, what began to happen was this. It went from strictly being religious in 1619 to where then in 1623, see, that's not but four years later, guess what happened? It became a decree that they would celebrate this every year, and it became not only a religious celebration, but it became a day of feasting and thanksgiving. Boy, don't that sound good, okay? So what happened was, after four years, they said, hey, we're going to get together, and we're going to thank God, we're going to praise God, but I want you to know something. We're, we're just going to get together together eat together, fellowship with one another, praise God together. Let me share something with you. It's very, very important. And I've noticed this over 30-something years of pastoral ministry. I really believe this. A lot of people may disagree with me, but experience is better than book knowledge on this. 
You find a church that eats together, and I'll show you a church that's close to one another. I'm telling you, folks, listen to me. We can preach, we can talk, and have, quote, worship service, but if you never sit down and rub elbows with fellow church members and fellowship with one another, you will miss out on the closeness of relationships that you can have. I really believe that. I believe that there's a great time for worship, but I'm going to tell you something. You need to sit down, eat with one another, fellowship with one another, and you can become close to one another. Now, I'm going to say this, and some people might, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring it down where the water hits the wheel. Are you ready? This, watch this. I'll show you a family that's close that can eat together. I'm going to tell you, listen to me. When, when you can't sit down and eat in fellowship, I'm going to tell you something, folks. This one's going here, this one's going here, this one's going here, that one's going there. And you can't sit down and eat with one another. I'm going to tell you something. That fellowship will not grow strong. But you remember this. Do you, have you ever thought about this? You look at the 12 apostles. Where were they always brought together? At the table. Jesus was always eating with them. Let me tell you something. It's important that we realize that we can worship together, but we can fellowship together and sit and dine together. And that's what they found out. After four years, they said, look, we're worshiping God and serving God, but, you know, we need to have some fellowship brought into this. And so what began to happen in this, out of this, that became a day of feasting, a time of fellowship with one another, a spirit of thanksgiving took place, and for years, it was celebrated tremendously. However, decade after decade, and even now, centuries after centuries, because it all began back in 1619. We've got to remember something. That as it was being celebrated and as it was being talked about, lo and behold, in time, and this is really a real late celebration, okay? It wasn't until 1941, okay? In 1941, the Congress ruled that Thanksgiving would be on the fourth Thursday of November. Have you ever thought about that? 1941 is really not that long ago, folks. I know some of you are saying, oh, yeah, I know that because I was born before 1941. Now, I was born way, way, way after 1941, okay? But, but it, was, you know, it was really not that long ago when you think about it. But having said that, let me say this. Now it's become a national what? Holiday. And you have, the, you know, the Thanksgiving parade. You got so much that's going on around the spirit of, of Thanksgiving. But let me say this, looking back in history, as we look at history, it seems that our early beginnings were a part of divine providence. I want you to remember that. That's the central theme this morning. Watch this. As we look at Thanksgiving and we look back in our history as a nation, the central theme, the interwoven thread is divine providence, the hand of God. And when you see that, we can see three great attributes that come out of that. What do you mean by that, Brother Steve? I, I just want to say this. Our nation began with a purpose, was blessed with provision, and it's backed by protection. Did you get that? Those three things, vitally important. Celebrating Thanksgiving in our nation could also, however, symbolize our lives. It could symbolize our lives. So we're going to take those three things that I just mentioned and parallel them with one another in relationship to the whole message in general. The first thing I want to say is this. As the early settlers came to this great continent here, we know as North America today, we must remember they came with a purpose. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for us. 
What do you mean by that, Brother Steve? Well, let's look back. When the early colonists came, they, the early settlers, as they came to this great nation, the thing that we must realize, they were in search, we know of, for political and religious freedom. That's what they came for, particularly religious freedom, but also political freedom. So when they came to this great nation that we have now known as America, it was a new beginning for them, and their heart searched for a new beginning, a new identity. Well, let me share this with you. Do you know that on a spiritual level, when Christ saves us, he changes us, and he gives us a new beginning. That's what Christ can do. And that's worth saying a spirit of thanksgiving. Amen? As sure as they came, it was wanting a new fresh breath on life. When Christ comes into your heart and he saves you, he gives you a new beginning. I love what we find in the scripture in relationship to that. Look with me in Romans chapter 6, okay? Romans chapter 6. And watch what Paul has to say as he was writing uh, to the churches in the area of Rome. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Watch what he says. But God be thanked, or thanked, that's what he just starts with that, but God be thanked that whereas ye were the servants of sin, he's talking about past, this is the way that you were, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, a transformation doctrine is what he's talking about. He says, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of of righteousness. Wow. So what he's simply saying is this, when our hearts are searching and we're looking for a new beginning, God can do a great creative work in our heart. We can obey the truth of the gospel, let that gospel permeate our hearts and our lives, and we can begin to be the servants of righteousness and the servants of the living God. You know one way that you can know that your life has been transformed? You know one way? that you can honestly see that, a changed heart. I am fully convinced of this. I've preached too many years. Religiosity won't get you there, folks. Too many people believe in religiosity. Well, I, I go to this church, and I go to this church, and I've done this, and I want you to know I'm going to lay out my spiritual credentials. Here they are. My question is this, have you had an encounter with Jesus Christ? It's the bottom line. Do you know him? Have you experienced him on a spiritual level? <laughs> Not some signature in a book that you belong to this church. Whole different ball game. Very important we understand that. Then I like what Paul says here in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, dealing with that. And I really want to look at one verse, but I want to back up to the verse that precedes that because the verse that precedes what I want to talk about makes me excited. Amen? Listen to what it says here in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, beginning in verse 1. It says, there is therefore now, that's present tense, Amen? It says, now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And he says, look, when you've been born again and you've been washed with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are no longer condemned. You are set free and willing and able to walk in the Spirit of the living God. And then watch what he says. He says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know what will change a man? You ready? You know what will change a man? You let the love of God and the grace of God and the redeeming grace of God be released in his heart, in his life, and in his spirit, and he'll become a new creation. That's what it takes. So we've got to realize when we start talking about the whole aspect of how our early settlers came with the purpose, God saves us with a purpose. And it's so important for us to believe that and to understand that in the journey. 
He saved us with a purpose. Now, you're going to say, well, Brother Steve, you still haven't told us the purpose yet. I, uh, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this was his part of his plan, is to redeem you. But here comes the purpose. Not only to save you. Look with me in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and don't forget 10. Okay? Now we're going to see the purpose in this. Watch this. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 9. Verses, um, I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, I mean, verses 8, 9, and 10. Listen to what he says. We know these verses. We could just quote them. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, what that's telling us is that we're saved by grace through faith, not by our own merit, but by his divine favor. That's what, we're, that's what we see. I'll never forget when I was just a young pastor, preacher. And boy, everybody wants to learn Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Everybody learns that. That's the salvational passage, that is. And I'll never forget my dear old saintly mother in her senior years. And she said, but, she said, don't you forget verse 10. Don't forget verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Oh, now let me tell you something. When it says we are his workmanship, don't you steal God's glory from what he's done in your life. That's the reason I am so, and I have to be very careful about this, but when I run into people and I talk to them and they talk about, well, I go to church here and I go to church there. I've done this and my daddy was a deacon and my mama served as this and my mama served as that. And they build up this big thing about, you know, I'm, I, I'm a Christian because of, don't you dare steal God's glory. Don't you rob him of who he is. The word of God says, for we are his workmanship, what he's done, not what you've done. Amen. Isn't that good? That's what God's done. He says, we are his workmanship created into Christ Jesus that we, that we might then, what, perform good works. So what we have got to realize is this. It's really, really simple. God transforms us for a purpose, and you know what he transforms us as a purpose, what the purpose is? Exactly what it says in verse 10, that we should be individuals who will show forth the glory of Christ. God is, God's purpose is to save you and to mold you and to change you into the likeness of his dear son. Well, Brother Steve, I don't know if I want to be saved for that purpose. Well, if you don't, then you're on the wrong boat. Here's the thing for us to realize. God has a purpose in saving you and he has a purpose for your life. And if you'll get tied in to what he wants to do in your life, he'll be glorified and your life will be fulfilled. I don't know about y'all, but that's a spirit of thanksgiving. Amen? It really is. <laughs> the second thing I want us to notice this morning is vitally important is, is this. It's real simple. As the early forefathers were blessed by provision, God makes provision for us. He makes provision for us. See, what we've got to realize is this. Some of our early forefathers, they faced hunger. It was, it was so bad. I mean, I mean the, with trying to produce the crops that they needed and everything. They were faced with hunger. They were faced with the cold winter days. Many of them lost their lives because of the cold, wintry, northeast winters, okay? Many of them lost their lives. And then sickness fell upon them as well. And so when you put all of that together, they really, really struggled. However, in all of their struggle, God still made a provision for them. And he helped them in this journey. Let me go ahead and say this. What's the hermeneutical arch for you and me today? In application to that, it's simply this. Some of our early forefathers, as they faced these things, we today are on a Christian pilgrimage ourselves, And on our Christian pilgrimage, my friends, you and I are going to face some trying times. It's going to happen. We find ourselves even today 
dealing with things that we're struggling with in our lives. And, and I just want to share this with you. As our forefathers struggled at the early beginnings of this great nation, we still struggle today with certain issues that we're dealing with in America. But I want to tell you something. Whomever you might be, if you will run to God, snuggle up next to him, and he will help make provision in your life. That's the God that we serve. We must understand that that is so true. Thinking about provision, let me say this. Do you know, this is something that's important, do you know that some of the Indians helped the early forefathers of this nation? Man, we'd have died and we'd have been wept, I mean, swiped away if it wouldn't have been for some of the Indians who actually befriended us and helped us or we would have never made it because of this reason. It was a new land, new habitation, completely different. Wasn't prepared for everything that we was going to have to deal with in relationship to our early forefathers. But remember this, if that's true for them, some of the Indians actually helped them. Remember this, God can send people into our lives as well that can help us in the journey of life. That's something we can learn out of the Thanksgiving experience. That's something we can learn out of the early settlers here in this great nation was that God sends people into our lives to help us in the journey of life. We need to be thankful for relationships that God's put together in our lives. Do you know this? Whether we want to admit it or not, watch. Do you know you really need people in your life? Do you know that? Now, I'm going to say something, and this, this might not float for some people, but I think a lot of you know me. I come from a family of six sons, working class people, hardworking people. And I'm still that type of guy, I believe in the macho man. And in God's house, we need macho men. We do. You know what? I like to hunt. I like to fish. Get my rabbit dogs out. Some people look at me, well, you're not smart. You're not educated. Baloney, I got a good education. But let me tell you something. Even though I like to be a macho man, you know what? I still need her in my everyday life. She's precious to me. She means a lot to my life. To make my life as full as God would have it to be. And let me tell you something. Don't you ever get to a place in this world to where you think you don't need anybody. You're the man. Need to be careful about that. What we've got to realize is this. We need people in our lives. Even though we may be strong spiritually, we need people. Remember this. God can bless us with provision through our connections with other people. <laughs> How do you like that one, okay? God can bless our lives through connection with other people. God sends people into our lives, and it can be in many, many ways. And by that, I simply mean this. God may send somebody into your life to speak a word of encouragement into your life. Look, look, look at me. Look, there's people need encouragement. And I want you to know God will send people into your life to, to help to encourage you and help to edify you along the way. And it's so, so important. You know, the Indians were there to help the early pilgrims. They were there to help. Look, look, God's going to send them type of people into your life today to help to encourage you along the way. And God will send people into your life to help give you some advice. And when we understand that, look, that's God's way of making provision for your life. I want to be honest with you. We all need help. I know what some of you are probably thinking. I don't need no help, son. I've got it all together. I know that. I like to think that too. 
I don't, I don't like the idea that I think I really, I can make it. I got it, buddy. I mean, y'all know what type of man I am, you know? I mean, hey, I like a man's man. But let me go ahead and tell you something. You still have to realize that in one breath, you can be gone. Just like that. So what am I trying to tell us? You remember this. God will put people into your life to help bring provision to where you can be more well-rounded in life. And we need to be thankful for that. Do you know David, he realized that. David did in the Old Testament. I, I don't, you don't have to turn there, but I'm, I'm going to say this. Y'all probably already know this verse. It's one little verse found in Psalm 23. It's the first little verse, and what does it say? It says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not what? Won't. For God took good care of him. Good care of him. And then also I want you to notice down here in uh, verse 4, it's very important what he has to say. Verse 4 is important. Later, we're going to find out where we can do it right now. Watch what he says. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, that's a spirit of protection that God gives as well, right there. Well, then look with me in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, okay? Philippians uh, chapter 4 is very, very important. Listen to what Paul had to say in regard to the aspect of God's provision. Listen to what he had to say here. He says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He will supply your needs, which means he is making provision for us. And it's important that we understand that as he makes provision for us, God will supply all of our, all of our needs. He doesn't say he's going to supply all of our wants, but he's going to supply our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Brother Steve, what are you saying? I'm simply saying this. Do you know that our Christian pilgrimage, it actually begins with a purpose. And the purpose is that he may make us into the likeness of his dear son. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Secondly, we've noticed this, that he also includes within this great Christian pilgrimage, he has blessed us with his provision. And we've seen that. The illustration is between the individuals that God sent into the lives of our early settlers. God's going to send people into our lives to help make provision in our lives that make us more of what God would have us to be. But thirdly and quickly, remember this. We are also backed by his protection. We're backed by his protection. And going back to what we looked at just a moment ago, listen to what David said over here in Psalm 23, verse 4, as I made mention of a moment ago. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David knew who was protecting him in the journey. So, so much. And then I also like what is said over in Psalm uh, 34. If you turn there with me, if you want to, Psalm 34. Uh, listen to this, these verses in uh, Psalm 34, verses 7 and 8. Uh, this is a very powerful passage of Scripture uh, that means a lot to us, okay? Psalm 30, 34, uh, verses 7 and 8. It says here, talking about God's divine protection, he says, The angel of the Lord encampeth around about those who fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in him. Wow. I like what he says up there in, in verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord encampeth around about those who fear him and delivereth them. We see God's divine hand of protection illustrated in that verse. And then turn on over, turn on over with me into some other areas that's so, so important for us to understand that's very important. And that's when we look on over here and we look in verse um, 23 of Psalm 37, okay? Psalm 37, and we look in in verse um, 23 and following. Listen to this. This is so, so important for us to understand. He says, the steps of a good man are ordained by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him 
with his hand. Wow. It says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth his seed as blessed. Wow. So when we think about that, remember this. This is very important. We understand that God is there to protect us in the journey. God is there for us. So here's something for us to realize and to understand, because I know I've went quickly on this last point, and I've had to due to time. But let me say this. Remember this, this Thanksgiving. May we have a spirit of thanksgiving and a spirit of gratitude. But remember this. As we celebrate Thanksgiving, acknowledge God's purpose. Thank God for his provision and experience his protection. That's what we can do. Will you bow your heads, please? Father in heaven, we're so thankful for who you are and for all that you do in our lives. Father, we're thankful for how you have spoken in, into our lives in various ways, even in the last week or so here. But Father, I just pray that this day some of us might need to respond to you in a very meaningful way. Some of us may need to come to the altar to say, Lord, you know, Thanksgiving is here, and I've got a lot to be thankful for. And God, I just want to come. I just want to, I just want to praise you. May you open my heart to have a spirit of, of gratitude towards you. Father, I just pray that you'll bless these few moments. Bless this invitation. May your spirit have his way in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name.